All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We do have a pretty tight schedule today. Uh, so as you noticed, we are recording this session. So um, this will be sent out to everyone that is registered uh, for today's session. And then uh, we will also have it available on our website for those that are uh, unable to join or that are uh, joining in late with us. So Thank you for joining. My name is Rihanna Weatherford. I am the Assistant Director of Trusts here at the Arc of Northern Virginia. This is First Friday's Future Planning with the Trust Department. And uh, we're really excited for today's session. We have uh, Key Bank here with us. As you, many of you know, uh, Key Bank is our trustee and we're so excited for the wonderful relationship that we have with them. Uh, they came into town, so they're actually here in our office today, which is very exciting. And uh, we held two sessions yesterday with them on Meet the Trustee. The turnout was phenomenal, and uh, we really um, feel like it was just, uh, it was a great come together moment, um, especially because it was our first time uh, getting together in person and hosting Meet the Trustee um, all together since uh, the pandemic. So it was very exciting for us. Um, so with KeyBank here today, uh, we have Cindy McDonald, we've got January Phillips, we have Vince Miles, and then um, we've also got uh, Jeannie Cummins from um, the uh, Office of Community Housing um, from the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Development Services. So uh, Jeannie is a guru on housing, and I'm very excited. This will be my first time hearing her speak with us, but um, I know that she has plenty of wonderful information to share with us as well today. So. Um, as you can see, we've got a pretty school full schedule and uh, we'll go ahead and get going soon. I just wanna review a few house rules that um, we are going to have everybody stay on mute. Uh, this is just so that we can continue uh, through the presentations. If you do have questions, we anticipate that there might be quite a few. Um, please post those in the Q&A section rather than the chat so that we can keep them all in one place. We expect that we were hoping to have a little bit of time at the end uh, to address some of your questions, but we expect that we may not be able to get to all of them. And so if we are not able to answer your question, um, please don't worry too much. We have already planned to um, address any questions that we're not able to get to during today's session. We'll go ahead and work with KeyBank to get answers for you. And then we will be sending out those questions um, in a separate email to everyone who's registered. So please feel free to um, share your questions in the Q&A and know that we will get to them for you. So let's move right along. Can I get the next slide, please? I just wanted to go ahead and touch on the ARC's mission. Um, you know, we are here to promote and protect the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we to actively support their full inclusion and participation in the community throughout their lifetimes. The Arc of Northern Virginia is a local chapter of one of the largest nonprofit organizations supporting thousands of people with IDD as well as their families. We call that the circle of support. Um, we are funded uh, through the services that we provide largely on uh, membership dues and donations. So that is the uh, trust program. Next slide, please. So the trust program, uh, you know, we bring with us more than 24 years of experience setting up and managing special needs trust in Virginia, Maryland, and DC. Um, we are one more one of more than 660 ARC chapters nationwide. There are 11 chapters in Maryland, 24 in Virginia, and one in DC. The ARC is um, the world's largest community-based organization of and for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities with over 62 years of experience. Next slide, please. Your trust team. You have myself, Rihanna Weatherford, the Assistant Director of Trusts. We have Ashley Welch, Welch our client manager. She handles a trust uh, establishment with, uh, with myself. Um, and then Kevin Collins is your account manager. Fiona Wright is our new client coordinator. Ali Shelby is your account coordinator, and Grace Rhodes is here with us controlling slides. So thank you, Grace. Um, she's our administrative coordinator. Grace is often uh, the first face that you'll see or voice that you hear when you call in. She schedules our trust establishment and, and makes sure you, that you get to where you need to go. Next slide, please. 
I'd also like to share with you our move. If you didn't already know, the Ark of Northern Virginia has moved to a new location. We are now at 3060 Williams Drive. Um, this is a Venture X building. We're on the third floor. We are very excited about this move and uh, love the new location. And we welcome you to come and visit us at any time. I am going to hand it off to um, Cindy. Did you want, uh, yes, I'm gonna have uh, Cindy go ahead and get started. Absolutely. You can actually just, uh, Grace, go ahead and jump to the first key dang slide. One more. All right. So for those, thank you so much, Brianna. We really appreciate being here. We're super excited to be in your new space. I'm in this very cool soundproof uh, room. It is really uh, lovely to present from. So just a little bit for those of you that don't know KeyBank, um, there may be some on the phone that is like, who's KeyBank? So we actually are uh, a bank, uh, the 11th largest commercial bank in the country. We've uh, been in business about 190 years, so pretty significant. We actually have branches and offices in 31 states. It kind of goes along the top corridor of the U.S. Uh, we have about 17,000 employees as well. So we've been, uh, we're pretty significant in size. We actually have a national trust charter, which allows us to do business in all 50 states. So go ahead and jump forward and I'll talk about the, a little bit about our relationship team. So this is the team that actually uh, works closely with the, with Rihanna, Kevin, and her team here at the ARC. So with the ARC, you know, obviously from the top down, I kind of go to that middle jump there. So Chris Gorman is the CEO of KeyBank. And then Joe Scarter kind of manages the, uh, all of the wealth services, private banking division. My team, we are headed up by Kathy O'Malley Carney. And then the relationship team that um, circles and works really closely with the ARC is Vince Miles, Peter Marici, Sandy Kubit, Stephanie January, and Linda. So it's a really t a diverse team with a lot of background, a lot of different technical background from investment management, tax, trust, uh, and real estate. So if you can see on the other side, what we do when we partner with the ARC is we help provide the administrative and fiduciary services, the investment management of the pools, the real estate services, which we're here to talk about today, unique assets as well, and the topic that no one likes to talk about, taxes. So if you want to jump forward one more time, what I'll do is I'll have January kind of jump in and just do a high-level overview of the real estate team, and then we'll do a little bit more before we go into a deeper dive. So January? Hello, everyone. Um, so to give you a little background on our trust real estate program, um, we are one of a few trust companies that actually offer individual real estate management. And for myself, I specialize specifically with supplemental and special needs trust management of real estate. So what that means is we offer full services of the management of the real estate, purchase, sales, transfers, um, deed transfers on death, and real estate holdings. So we take away the burden of managing and maintaining it um, from individuals, families, and companies. So we have a long-standing history of serving families, institutions, and specifically nonprofit organizations such as the Arc of Nova. Um, we offer flexible management of the assets as well as take into account um, the individual needs of each beneficiary. Next so when slide, you go please. to the next slide, the one thing. Yeah, when you want to, I just wanted to kind of jump here and talk a little bit about the fiduciary standard of care, because I think that's really important to understand as a family when you're looking to actually either buy, purchase, or transfer real estate into your child's special needs trust. Um, and the one thing I really want to point out here is this is like the third bullet point, the second bullet point from the bottom really is that we are a fiduciary. So we are held to a much higher standard than that of other advisors and RIAs um, in the industry. So we are overseen by the control of the currency, the OCC. So we are regulated heavily. So they really come and they make sure that we're doing our investment management and our and administrative prudence to the highest of the standards. So just knowing that, um, that there's great oversight on all that we do, I feel like is a, a level of comfort to our clients. So if you jump to the next slide, just want to kind of talk about what the circle looks like. So with the beneficiary being in the middle and the Arcanova, there's a lot of specialties, a lot of special folks that kind of circle this, this relationship with, of course, up to the right, January being the trust real estate officer. So there's a lot of different um, interactions between the family and the ARC, and it's January, myself as a fiduciary strategist. We have Vince Miles, your relationship manager. We have Linda Hall, who brings in the tax perspective and overview. 
Pete Marici, who manages the investments. And, of course, it's the ARC and the family or the guardian or POA of the beneficiaries. So it's like a, like a, like a big family circle that we work really closely together to ensure that we're doing the right thing when it comes to real estate. We're going to just jump to the next slide. I'll pass it back to January, and we'll start getting in the weeds about real estate. So a large part of managing real estate for us is reducing the risk to our clients, to the trust as well. Um, so one thing that we do is we proactively determine and work to mitigate those risks with our insurance policies. So we have a master plan that we use that offers comprehensive, comprehensive coverage that isn't usually available for your individual plans that you would have on your homeowners. Um, so additional things such as wind damage, flood insurance, earthquake, and then even vacancy coverage. So if somebody has to leave the house, we can adapt the insurance to cover for any losses associated with that. Um, in addition, we do allow you to bring your own policy over too. We review it against our policy every year to make sure you're fully covered, the trust is protected too. So protecting our beneficiaries is the biggest thing for us. Next slide, when you please. think about it, real, when you think about it too, and I'll just before we rule on with there, it's like so with when it comes to real estate, if you're adding it to your trust, it is an asset of the trust. So you look at it as you have stocks, you have bonds, and then you have real estate in the portfolio. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of that real estate, not only for the beneficiary, but for the well being of the trust too, because it is considered an asset. So on this page, um, I don't know why the words kind of scrunched up there, but that's okay because we can share this deck afterwards. Is that there's a lot of conversation that goes into is it is it appropriate to move a particular piece of real estate into trust to have the trust purchase a piece of real estate or even sell a piece of real estate? So the conversation usually start will start with the ARC up front on the enrollment process or just having that initial conversation. And it's literally just like, what are we looking at here? What is it a primary residence? Um, what does the house look like? What is the disability of your child? Is that house really suitable? Is it the family home that you really want to pass on? Or does it make, and then does it make sense for your child to live in that home when you're no longer there? Can they manage the real estate? Will they be able to get up and down stairs or manage uh, an acre or two of property that you have? So we really like to do an in-depth conversation up front of what we're looking at when it comes to the actual real estate itself. Um, the home that we're talking about, and the beneficiary who will be living in that home. Um, Danny, I don't know if you want to add to that upfront process before we kind of go on to the rest here. Yep. So some of the things that we ask for are the deed, your real estate taxes, a copy of your current budget. So that those three things give us an idea of who owns the home, what we have to do to transfer if you choose to move it into trust, and how much is it going to cost to maintain the home so we're not draining the trust and the beneficiary is fully covered? Um, so once we have all those, we work closely with the ARC to determine, is this the best course of action? Yes, because the one big thing is, is like if you, if we're, what we do is we look at the whole financial picture for the beneficiary. So what's the balance of the trust? What is the value of the home? Are there enough assets in the trust outside of the home that can actually support the beneficiary? And thinking like future needs, like what does the care plan look like? Down the road, will we need to dig into the trust a little bit more for like medical needs and support, caregivers, whatever the costs may be that come out of the trust? because we want to make sure that beneficiary is taken care of first and foremost. And if there's, if we feel like once we do an analysis, there's, there's enough to support the home because it's not just the home being in trust, it's all that goes to support it. So it's your real estate taxes, it's your homeowner's insurance, your maintenance, your upkeep. Do we need a new roof on the house? Do we need to revamp a ramp to get into the house or out of the house? So these are all the things that we look at because the last thing we want to do is move a piece of real estate into trust have that beneficiary living there, mom and dad pass away, and now two or three, four years later, there's not enough funds to support the home. Then we have to relocate the beneficiary to a different type of living environment, which is probably going to be incredibly upsetting, and sell the family home. Last thing we want to do. So we mm -hmm. want to do a lot of analytics up front to see that this makes sense. So this page kind of covers like a much more, like it actually is like half of what we have when we get into those deep dive conversations around like the financial discovery, the documents that January reviews, and then just really getting into actual the home itself. Is the home 40, 50 years old? Are we looking at maintenance here that we didn't think about when we're buying the home? Um, and, and it's just really making sure it's appropriate because 
there's three things that we can't do um, when it comes to real estate and holding it in trust is one, we cannot have a group home held in trust. It's just a key bank policy, unfortunately. So if you're thinking of, oh, I'm going to leave my five bedroom home in trust, my son or daughter can live there, and then we can rent out and create a group home. Unfortunately, that's a piece of real estate that we cannot manage in trust. It's the only type, really, basically. Um, and then there's just two other points. And one is like if your son or daughter actually has, is an entrepreneur and they have their own business and they're going to run the business out of the home, we can't do that either. And then, believe it or not, <laughs> breeding pets. So you, if your dog has puppies, that's one thing. That is totally fine. But if your job or your business is to breed animals and to sell them, that's the third component that we cannot do. And I say this through experience. <laughs> it's just, you know, I was part of the real estate committee for 20 years, so we see a lot of things coming in and out. So those are just three policies that the bank kind of holds on. But, like, it's the floor is open for every other type of real estate just, just to have a conversation about on whether or not you want to move that piece of real estate into trust. So you want to get into actually what it looks like to accept the piece of real estate January? Sure. <laughs> next slide, All right, please. Let's move on to the next slide. So we have dedicated officers who manage properties everywhere from Maine to Alaska, all the way down to Florida and west of there as well. So after we've reviewed all the documents, determined the properties are good fit for the trust and that's a good fit for the beneficiary. Um, once it's accepted, we request an appraisal. We also request a full inspection inside and out to make sure that we aren't missing anything. So we know upfront what maintenance items are needed, that there's no environmental issues um, that could impact the trust or impact the beneficiary at some point in time. So once all that's done, we bring it through our committee and they make the final decision to reject or accept uh, the property into the trust. So and moving the on, kind of talks about we, we actually have Secretary. a whole process for the sale of real estate as well. Um, it's pretty similar to purchasing real estate. And again, if you're looking to have the property in the trust and it eventually needs to be sold for whatever number of reasons, um, we completely manage that for you. So we take the property, we do a full appraisal on it. Uh, we find a realtor or broker to use um, who helps us value the property, list a property, and we manage all the documentation uh, from there. So some things we consider, full title examination, because we do a fiduciary deed, which is a little bit different than your traditional quick claim or warranty deed, um, a survey, a land survey, and then we also make sure we know the rules of your condo association or your homeowners association if we need to get their permission to sell. So the other parts of it are all the contract parts. We review any condi conditions or contingencies that are required. We negotiate with the future buyer using our real estate agent or broker. Um, and the only commissions that are paid are paid at the closing of real estate to the um, real estate brokers. So we go right through from A to Z on it. And the most that we have to do is make sure, you know, the houses, the beneficiaries are moved. If they need help with that, we work closely with the ARC to make sure we have moving companies or personnel to help. So all those little points, we will work closely with the ARC with as well and keep everybody involved, informed. So again, this just goes through the, the remainder of the review of everything. Um, and purchasing a property is, is similar. So it's determined that yes, the trust wants to purchase a property, we'll hire a real estate broker or agent, um, determine with the ARC, what's the best suitable type of house. So we start there. Where do you wanna live type of house and how much is actually can we afford, which includes taxes and maintenance and all the utilities, um, and again, assisting with canceling utilities, starting utilities, um, transfer of the assets. So we do everything pretty much. And then one good component too is so like when a house is held in trust, um, so real estate bills, taxes, homeowners insurance, that gets directly mailed to 
um, the bank and the ARC so that we can actually make sure that those bills are being paid on time and it's not like it's not going to the home and then the home, the person living in the home takes maybe a week or two to get that over to the ARC or key bank and say, oh, we got our real estate taxes. So we never want to default on those. So you kind of do a beeline. It's only the, it's the one unique component of real estate is we have those bills come directly to us so that we don't miss a beat and make sure that everything is always current. So that's a super high level overview because I know there's going to be a, a lot of questions and I would love Jeannie to chime in because she has an incredible wealth of knowledge in, in this space as well. But just the, the couple of things to remember, and this is super important, is that if you are working on your state plan, thinking of moving real estate into trust, when you're working with your attorney, please make sure they're well-versed in special needs or elder care. It is really important that they understand that component of it because it's um, special needs, as we all know, is a very unique um, it's unique when it comes to estate planning because we want to make sure that all assets are always in the name of the trust and never in the name of your child So, because we never always want to protect the benefits that they're receiving. So, And if you don't have an attorney or someone that you know of, the ARC always has a repository of a couple of attorneys that they, work, they, they know, they've worked with in the past, and that are dependable. So reach out to them, and I'm sure that they can provide you with a, a great list of references. So... With that, I think before we jump over to questions, Jeannie, if you wanted to add anything, because I know your brilliance in this field is <laughs> outshines everything. No, there's really nothing nothing to, to add at this point. I, um, you know, what I can tell folks is that uh, if you are considering looking at uh, placing a house in trust. Um, and then seeing whether the individual whether the individual would qualify for rent assistance, the likely qualify for rent assistance, such as a housing choice voucher or a uh, the state rental assistance program, which the Commonwealth of Virginia has. Um, however, it, it's a bit of uncharted territory. I can tell you that we had uh, we worked with an individual whose house was placed in trust. It was originally in a uh, uh, a living will, and then upon the parent's death, it was transferred into a special needs trust. And uh, I worked extensively with this individual to try to get their, uh, uh, to try to get a housing choice voucher, which is a rent subsidy that would have helped cover the rent because essentially the way that would be structured is the special needs trust trustee <laughs> is the, uh, is acting as the uh, uh, owner slash property manager of the home. So the, the theory was that the person could rent from, from the trust. Uh, unfortunately, our, uh, our local housing authority didn't see it that way and they bumped up to HUD for consideration and they didn't see it that way either. They felt from their vantage point, it, they felt that it looked as, uh, as though the, uh, the, the, the payment of the rent subsidy was going to somehow benefit the beneficiary, the individual. Now, we all know that that's probably not the case because the way that the most of these trusts are structured, the beneficiary gets the use of the house while, for, for as long as they can use it, um, but they aren't going to benefit from any income that's generated from that house. It's probably going to go to pay all the expenses that Cindy in January just talked about. So um, so, so from a practical perspective, you one could make an argument that there is, that the beneficiary is not benefiting from the rent subsidy payment because it's going to go to the trust. The trust is going to use it to pay for household uh, for for operating expenses for the house. And then upon that person's death, that house is likely to be transferred to uh, the if the house is sold or not. Uh, it's likely that the the the, the uh, value is likely to be transferred to another party. Um, so it still is not going to benefit the individual. Um, but that's again not how HUD has seen it in the one instance that we have tried to make and, and push this this case. So so I guess the, I bring that up to your attention to just say eyes wide open. That if you go into this, you may uh, you're probably going to need an attorney <laughs> to help you navigate those um, uh, discussions that will likely occur. Uh, probably, you know, with the HUD's regional field office. Now, on the SRAP front, the state rental assistance front, we're not that picky because we get that it doesn't really benefit the individual. 
So it would be possible. The issue there is that, um, you know, the parent, grandparent or guardian cannot be living with the person. They cannot uh, be the uh, owner or the property manager for 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 the the uh, home at the time that the individual is receiving rent assistance, so they really can't have any part in that, which actually works very well with the trust because, of course, the special needs trustee or key bank is actually the is going to be performing all of those functions. So so we 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 have not seen it happen yet, but we believe there's a better chance of being able to do this with the state rental assistance program. That's all I got for you right now. <laughs> so I see we have a bunch of questions in, in uh, the Q&A. Dan, uh, Rihanna, you want to maybe we'll start answering some questions. I'm sure that'll generate a lot more. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So let's start. If the trust pays for the insurance policy, is the policyholder considered the SNT? So the yeah, so that the it's an asset of the trust. So the the insurance policy, the homeowners insurance, the homeowners policy is on the house, which is in the trust. So yes. All right. Um, that was an easy one. Thank you for starting off easy. <laughs> <laughs> Can contained real estate include contract management and maintenance? I think that was answered, but I'll let you go ahead and um, January if you want to so add there's anything. A so what? I'm not sure January's on because she had a fire drill pop up in her building. <laughs> so that I could take charge. <laughs> so if there's contract maintenance on the house, like lawn, the Orkin man, whatever they may be. So we would just review to make sure that that's, you know, if the contract is, um, is, you know, makes sense for the home, then absolutely we, the trust would continue to pay, make those payments for the contract and maintenance. Um, but if we see that, you know, and we always work with the ARC on this. If we see that a lawn maintenance bill is like exuberantly large and we're like, well, maybe we should look and see if there's like, let's get a, a, an estimate on two other lawn maintenance practices because maybe this particular practice is taking advantage of the home, uh, the people in the home. So we've always been to make sure. So we're very vigilant on that, those types of invoices and making sure that they, they make sense, so to speak. So we're just like another fiduciary set of eyes. But yes, we continue paying contract maintenance on the home. All right. Our daughter already lives in a group home. Our home is in a joint revocable trust, and we want it sold with the proceeds managed by the special needs trust. Do you sell the house? Yes, we can sell the house. So if the home is in your revocable trust right now, there's two things, there's two ways that you can do that is one, you could have uh, your current trustee sell the home in the revocable trust and then fund the um, the third-party trust because you, you wouldn't want to put that in your first or you can actually transition the home into the third party um and if you're if you're if yeah your daughter's lives at a group home you can transfer it to the third party and we can take care of that sale for you and flip it into um cash and then invest in the trust but i think with that situation where your daughter lives at a group home it makes sense to have the revocable trust sell it and then fund your third party her third party trust with that Okay. Why can't you hold a group home in trust? It's just a key bank policy that we have in place because of the, the different liabilities. One, it's say you have, say the daughter lives, owns the home and she has five other bedrooms that she's created a group home. It gets very, uh, there's, a, there's a higher liability on that because it's one, she's one of one fifth living in the home. So it's like breaking out the expenses. There's a lot that goes into it. So over time, KeyBank just came out with a policy that we just we we can't effectively and efficiently manage a group home the way we way most people can. So we've just decided as a policy not to to engage in group homes. They are great. I've I work with many organizations that they do a tremendous amount with group homes, and they're they're wonderful establishments for people to independently live. Cindy, can I just pop in and and add another consideration that might make you know might ring resonate with folks is that. You, know, you have to remember yeah. that group homes are licensed in Virginia, and there are incredible regulatory considerations and rules that, that group homes must follow. And I, the trustee is likely not an expert in those regulations, but may find themselves liable for uh, adhering to them. Plus, you'd have to, the trustee would then have to engage, if the trustee wants to 
minimize that exposure to those regulations, they're probably going to partner with another organization that is a group home provider. But if that group home provider screws up, <laughs> there is still a potential mm -hmm. that, that that regulatory burden could fall back on the trustee. So the, it there's a lot of the, adding the group home layer to just a house for rent adds in a, a layer of complexity and liability that is that is, that is extreme. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeannie. That is a very good consideration because I didn't know that. Um, this is a good question too. Uh, can a home that is a standard rental property or an air like an Airbnb be held in trust? Standard rental property, yes. Um, we can absolutely have a rental property held in trust. And then we actually can, we would act as property managers. So we would manage the home, collect the rent. That actually would be income to the trust. Um, so yes, we can manage that. The Airbnb, I don't know. So that is that's, a question I would have to follow the group. That's a good one. That's the first time that ever came to me. And I should know because I rent Airbnbs quite often. So I will follow up with you on the Airbnb question. All right. Well, um, this person's also uh, actually a real estate agent. And uh, so he followed up to ask about, um, and I, I've actually wondered this too, how uh, are the real estate agents um, like appointed for the special needs trust, like a home that's purchased in trust? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question. So one, we, we approach the family. We're like, do you, uh, is there an agent that you worked with in the past that you're comfortable with? Because it's really important that the family is comfortable with the agent um, because, they, I mean, they're searching for a home for their son or daughter. So we, you know, we start there. If they don't know, we will work with the ARC to see if they have any recommendations on real estate, on real estate agents or brokers to work with. Uh, and then if not, January has a repository that she can go to at, at a national level. So that's good to know. I don't think that we do have um those I, I might connect with January to to make sure that we have a list of the um you know agents that are uh, experienced with special needs trusts so that's because great. that's important to have the agent have that understanding and that experience as well absolutely all right and then another question is it required to use a real estate broker yes it makes the most sense um, you know, it's, it's, if you're trying to do a for sale by owner, there's so many things that can slip through the cracks. We really want to make sure that we're doing the right thing here. So yes, we will engage with the real estate broker and we'll negotiate their fee. So it's not like we're just saying, yep, we'll do it. Whatever your fee is, we're trust me, <laughs> we push back and we negotiate everything for, on behalf of the beneficiary and the family. All right. And we've got another question here. It seems like it's a, it has a few parts to it. So I'm going to um, break it down for you. So the siblings will oversee the trust for our third son who is disabled. Uh, can they decide to purchase or sell the property? So are they overseeing it? Are they just, are they trustees or are they part of the ARC where we're trustee? I mean, that's an important question because if they're overseeing their sibling, it's basically it's the trustee's responsibility to provide that oversight. So we work closely with the ARC to talk with the family if the siblings are have, have the responsibility of, of overseeing their their other sibling we'll have a conversation around budget what makes sense what would work so instead of mom and dad it would be the siblings that we'd work with if the mom and dad were no longer around so that's a if if we're keeping trustee it's our responsibility but if it's a standalone off to the side and you're not working with the arc um, that would be on you so but if you are working with the arc we work together and if the disabled son dies, who mechanically hires and sells the property? So that would be key bank. But I'll let you go ahead and take that. Yeah, no, that's if, if when the benefit, you were talking about when the beneficiary passes, what happens to the real estate? So we would take over as uh, that would be our responsibility to make sure that we would work the family to do like just like an estate. So you would, you know, cleaning at the home, getting it ready for listing. We would sell the real estate. It would you know, liquidate it as a cash and then terminate the trust by the terms of the joinder agreement. All right. And then that money would be um, returned to the trust and then uh, distrib dis distributed to um, the remaining remainder beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. All right. So then... Um, Another question. Can you speak a little to the fees that KeyBank charges for administering uh, real estate assets for the s and 
both ongoing fees for normal activities, as well as periodic fees for unusual activities. So there's really, it's, so when we're first looking at real estate, there's the fee of just the inspection. So that's, it's a nominal fee. If an appraisal is needed, then there's, there's a fee as well for the appraisal. But for the ongoing maintenance and upkeep, it is basically just the investment management fee that's applied. So like I said, it's stocks, bonds, real estate. So it would just be a part of the market value. Um, the only other fee is if we're actually buying or selling the real estate, then it's a very nominal fee. It's between 1% and 3% of the market value of the home. And it's typically the 1% side because the, the 2 or 3% is when it's very complex, lots of moving parts, more so than any – When I'm sure we've all bought homes, bought and sold, so more so outside of the realm. So a typical purchase or um, sale of a real estate, it's typically 1% of the market value. So – now, those are the only other nominal fees that would go with real estate. Thank you, Cindy. All right. Okay. And then does the ARC work with select law partners located in Fredericksburg, Virginia? The answer is yes. And uh, if you would like to shoot me an email at rihanna.weatherford at thearcofnova.org, I can provide you that information. What is the process for providing regular reporting to the guardian on the payments made by KeyBank. So for instance, utilities, insurance, taxes, et cetera. So you'll see that in the, um, you'll see that in the, the monthly statement. So as the utility bills come through, um, I mean, it, I think that's a, a, a one off, like a, a conversation to be had, I think with the ARC too. So it's going to be more or less, if, if the guardian would like to see the bills, we can send you copies. That's very easy to do. Um, so that you can keep track on your end, um, but you'll see those bills come through in the statements that are being paid. Like I said, it's the real estate and homeowners. Those are the two most important ones that we make sure that they come to us to pay so there's no default. I think utility bills are sent straight through to, to the yep. ARC, and uh, Rihanna, you and Kevin take care of that. Yep, and then um, anything that, you know, KeyBank receives, they will communicate that to us. And then, um, you know, obviously for distributions from the trust, we're communicating that to them. And so we, you can really see how this partnership works together. Um, we, uh, there's not a day that goes by that I probably don't talk to Cindy at some point. Um, so, all right, the next question. Do you have to change the way the home is titled? Someone told us that you have to change the title to the estate of, is this true? So if you're actually transferring, so if the home is in your name now and your mom and you want to transfer it into your child's third party special needs trust, then yes, you have to change the deed in the title on the home to reflect that. So before that, so that kind of goes down another avenue and I'm going to take two seconds to kind of talk about that. Before you make that change, you need to reach out to Rihanna and her team to have that conversation so that we can talk about the real estate, kind of like what it looks like and do a whole assessment up front. Um, instead of like for people that just go without communicating with the ARC or key bank and change the deed, just thinking they're going to go ahead and put it into the trust. And when things like we don't want to get to the point where all of a sudden you're past, we're realizing that the deeds changed because we haven't been notified. And now we have to make an assessment when your child is grieving your loss and you just don't want that to happen. So that's why I always say communication is key. Make out, make sure that you reach out to Rihanna. Let's have that conversation. Let's talk it through what it looks like because the the biggest thing for me is like when you pass, we want to make sure that your son and daughter that they're they're grieving, so they're dealing with that, and they don't want to. I don't want to have to deal with like, oh my gosh, now I have to move them out of the home that they've been in their whole life, put them somewhere else in a, in a different living environment, and upset the apple cart further than what's happening. So let's talk. Let's get those conversations going. Absolutely, I 100% agree with that. So. Okay. And then also um, a follow-up on that is, is there a title company that does this kind of change uh, relatively inexpensively? Because um, this individual said that they've received some pretty high quotes on this. So do we have- So any I can, um, January, yeah, January definitely has a repository of title companies that they use. And because uh, she would, she, we would be able to come up with a decent title company. Um, I don't know what the going rate is, but she would know that information. So just know that it's because we have uh, real estate offices that cover the entire country. So we have a lot of resources at our fingertips um, that this is all they do is real estate held in trust day in and day out. So they would have resources to kind of help you with that. Absolutely. Plus January we're managing that process for you. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's a, that's a key point there is that um, having January uh, as part of this is, is really a great resource because she does have that um, 
access. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our sons with special needs are likely to live 40 to 50 years after we die. Our trust funds won't last that long, even with SSI and any small amounts of money that they will earn. What happens when the trust money runs out? So, so I guess I'm not sure. Are we, a, yeah, I'm not sure there's a real estate question in there. Yeah. Yeah, because I guess um, I, that's my question is if, if there was real estate in there um, or not. So um, this is submitted by an anonymous attendee. If you could send me a little bit more information via email, um, we've put my my email address in the chat box here for you. Um, please send me some more information and we can sidebar and I can give you some resources and, and some more information on that. Thank you very much. So um, let's see, we... So we already have two uh, special needs trusts for our grandchildren, and we'd like to speak at some, to someone at Key Bank about possibly being the trustee for my personal trust, um, of which the grandchildren are the beneficiaries. Um, we're also considering putting real estate into each of their trusts. Would the brothers be considered a group home? No, it's, it's, there's a whole, and Jeannie can definitely attest to this and try in if I'm saying this incorrectly. A group home is like a specific designation. So, no, that's just you, the grandkids having their own homes. And no, if two brothers are living together, that's two siblings living together in a home. So that's not considered a group home. Um, but let's, you know, I can, reach out to Rihanna so she can put you in touch with us because I want to make sure let's have that conversation. Yes, Key Connect is a trustee for your personal trust. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, we're, we've been doing that for many clients for many years. But what I want to talk about is I want to make sure that the titling that you have, because you said that about leaving funds to, your, to the grandkids, I want to make sure it's leaving funds to your grandchildren's trust. So I want to make sure let's have that conversation to really make sure. So reach out to Rihanna and she can put you in touch with myself and Vince and let's, let's have a sidebar and, and talk that through. Absolutely. All right. Uh, does Social Security reduce monthly payments by the one-third rule since the property is owned and provided by the S&T? So it wouldn't... I believe it does. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Rihanna. Well, I was just going to say, um, yeah, because it would be in the... Uh, the trust, so therefore it wouldn't be considered a resource. I think that's, the question here is, question. is whether the trustee is charging the individual rent. Oh, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. So if the, so just like you do, just like families, you know, individuals who live with their families right now, right. if the family charges them rent with a lease agreement, then that one mm -hmm. third rule does not kick in if they do not, because it's considered in kind support and maintenance. If the family does charge or the trustee does charge rent, then that it, that one third deduction and has a lease to prove it and all that, then that one third deduction would not take place. Thank you. She does not charge. Thank you, Jeannie, for that. Yeah, the trust, we do not charge rent. That's the home that you're putting in trust for the benefit of your child. All right. If the trust owns the home and pays all of the bills, does it potentially, oh, here, yeah. Does it potentially impact the beneficiaries of Social Security um, as they would no longer be able to claim the rent and living expenses? So I think, Jeannie, this is a similar question. Yeah. Right. It's just kind of the flip side of that coin. So, yes, if the trust owns the home, pays all the bills, and doesn't charge rent, then that the trust is providing in kind support and maintenance, and if the person gets SSI, it'll be reduced. That yeah. that SSI payment will be reduced. All right. Um, will the bank be able to deduct or? What was it? What was it? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm able to understand the question. Um. Hey Dan, if you could if you could rewrite that for me, I'm not sure I understand that. All right. 
Does not accepting a group home mean that a sibling cannot share the residence with a disabled loved one? Uh, not accepting a group home. I mean, no, you addressed this already. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, if, it's just, so. <laughs> if it's just two siblings who happen to live together in the same house and they share it as a common household, then no, that's not a group home. It's a group home when the, right. that house gets licensed by a provider um, that is billing Medicaid waiver or 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 even billing you know privately for private pay. But that's it's just two people living together does not constitute a group home. Thank you, Jeannie. Okay. Thank you. Jeannie, I think this one's gonna be for you too. Um, because I think it might be another variation of a question we just answered, but I could be wrong. Are there any concerns with a home which the child lives in rent fee being in a special needs trust from the standpoint that the child is getting a housing benefit? Uh, well, the child would not get a, be able to get a housing benefit if it were rent free. <laughs> exactly. So, so I mean, a housing, a housing subsidy is based on the fact that the person has to pay rent in order to live in a place, but can't afford it, can't afford that rent. So, so if the uh, if the individual isn't charged rent, then their their a housing benefit wouldn't come into play, or housing assistance wouldn't come into play. Thank you. My son is um, a one fourth owner of his grandparents' home. Uh, how can I protect his uh, one fourth interest? He is currently living in that home. So my question to is, if your son is the one quarter owner of his grandparents' home, is it in his name um, or is it already in his quarter interest in the name of his trust? So I would need to know that before kind of answering that question, because to protect his quarter interest is difficult. If it's in his name, I mean, it's a, it's, he owns that. It's a, it's a resource. It's a, um, it's, that's a tricky it's a tricky question to answer. I would need to know just a little bit more on that. Uh, let's see, Jocelyn, if you want to go ahead and email me, my uh, email address is in the chat here, and I can uh, follow up with Cindy on that for you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right. If the special needs individual dies, can a trust be set up to give the house in trust to their surviving sibling? So I'm going to I'm going to guess the scenario on this that the it's a third party family trust and the home is in the trust and the beneficiary passes so I'm just wondering so it's you can name whatever whom whomever you want if it's another trust or another sibling as the remainder interest in that trust that is not a problem and yes like you can actually transfer the house in kind back from the third party trust to the siblings trust or the siblings direct it gets diff it's very different when it's in the first party, which is very rare to see a home held at a first party trust. So uh, typically these are 99.9% .9 held in third party family trusts. So I would say when, when the beneficiary passes, yes, it can be set up to have the house pass into trust for a sibling or to a sibling. Thank you. All right. Do you prefer that a family house be owned by a family member and then rented to the child as opposed to being owned by the special needs trust? That's a great question. It is a good question. And honestly, so this is where I say you really need to engage with your attorney to really run that out, because that is definitely a question around um, the family's estate plan and what that situation looks like for us. We can do either either way works for us, but it's like what's best for you as the family, what's best for the, the beneficiary as well, um, because there's definitely different legs to this. In different scenarios, when the, when the trust owns the house, I mean it's it's a different scenario as when now your your family members owning the house now that they're paying rent. That's different. That's kind of what Jeannie and I have been talking about the last couple of questions. Yep, seems I'm like Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you have, we'll go ahead and answer this. Um, if you have one roommate that is considered, or if you have a roommate. Is that considered a group home when the home um, is not run like a group home? No, that gets into the licensing aspect that Jeannie was talking about. 
All right. Uh, the home is currently a sponsored residential home, which does have does have to be licensed. I envision having two separate homes for boys. I'm not sure I got the question there. <laughs> me, me either, because if, if it's a residential home, which is licensed, then we can't hold it in trust. Right. So I'm not sure what two separate homes for the boys are. Yeah, Wanda, um, you're welcome to follow up with me via email if you like. Um, my disabled sister lives in a condo that I own. If the condo is transferred to her special needs trust, does KeyBank actually purchase the condo? And if so, uh, where are the proceeds deposited? So KeyBank does not actually purchase that at all. That would be an asset of your sister's trust. So her her trust would purchase the condo from you, and it would become an asset of her trust. Thank We're you. just the trustee doing all the oversight. All right, and we spoke a little bit about fees, so I think we've answered that. If, let's see if we can answer this. If the other heirs are deceased, will the trust apply for tax exemption on the individual's behalf each year? The heirs are deceased. Will the trust apply for tax exemption? I do not fully understand, but I would have to, I don't think I can truly answer that right now. That may be a Linda question, Rihanna. Okay. Jocelyn, if you want to follow up with me on that question, I think we have another question to follow up with you as well. So, um, I, and I can direct that to Linda. She's not on with us today. I, I can reach out to her. Um, would the trust manage, let's see, Mark. Nope, then, okay. The slides will be sent out um, within the next day or so. I think it does. I think they go out the following day, um, Mark, to answer your question. When bills are paid by the SNT, are they considered taxable disbursements to the beneficiary? Super high level answer is no. And there's a lot of calculations that go into that. So, um, we should at meet the trustee last night. Linda had a great description around what this looks like because there's two factors that go into the taxes that come out of a trust that go uh, on a K-1 or a grant a letter to the beneficiary. So uh, I can, we can probably follow up with a more detailed response from what Lin from Linda's notes from last night, Rihanna. So we can, we can take that question and then respond back more fully. Um, Perfect. I, I definitely have some notes on that. Yeah. Okay. So that, for that goes that, deep in the tax world. <laughs> yeah. Um. And and like like Cindy said, we we talked about this at, at uh, great length yesterday with um, uh, the participants of our Meet the Trustee event. Um. What we can go ahead and do is we are as mentioned um at the beginning of this, uh, is that we will have questions um and answers since uh, that we're going to email out. So we'll make sure that that's part of it. Thank you so much for that question. What if you have two kids, one of whom will have the special needs trust and one who is will not, um, but is also an heir? Um, would you title the property or how would you title the property then when you don't want 100% of it to go to the trust? So that's where it gets really tricky because the S and T would have to be a hundred percent owner of the home. So we can't, and we can't have a 50% ownership in the home for the S and T and then 50% ownership by regular heir, so to speak. So um, that's a decision by mom and dad. You know, do you put the home in trust for the, in the SNC for the benefit and then offset your regular heir in a different way? Um, that's, that kind of jumps up to your whole estate plan and what that may look like. Um, but it's de definitely a conversation I suggest that, you know, get recommendations from your special needs planning attorney or elder care attorney that can actually kind of talk you through what this would look like, because this is basically even equalizing out an estate. So it's, you make the decision, do you want the home in the special needs trust or not? Because it can't be a 50, 50 split. You know, thank you for that, Cindy, because I think that, um, 
we had a, a few questions on that, like, and everyone posted them at the same time. So it's just <laughs> interesting um, to be able to see how that worked out. But uh, I think we're going to go ahead and make sure that that's included um, in the question and answers that we that we send out, because it, it seems like there are a few individuals out there who, um, you know, the the individual with special needs um, has a 50 percent interest in the, the, the asset. So we've gone ahead and included that. Thank you all for, for participating there. Um, see if our will says that everything goes to the special needs trust do we also have to change the deed and would that would it be final i.e what if we want to sell the house before the children get benefit of the third party trust there's two approaches to that you can absolutely do it through your will and kind of change it up there or you can do it um you can do a transfer on death deed. So basically you're still owner of the home. You can sell the home at any point in time, but if you're still in the home and you happen to pass, it can automatically transfer into the special needs trust. So there's two approaches to that. Um, I always suggest run it through with your attorney, kind of talk through both approaches and which one makes sense, but both would, both would come, both would get to the end uh, exactly this both ways to get to the end. I can't even talk anymore. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of uh, presentations over the last two days, but you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, and you know what? I think actually, Cindy, that's going to be our last question of today. Um, we are at the end of this, um, the a lot of time for this session. So I thank you both. Um, and thank you, Miles. Um, January is no longer with us because they had a last minute fire drill, but um, hopefully that went well. Uh, thank you, Grace, for controlling the slides here. Jeannie, it was lovely to have met you, and we really appreciate you coming in um, with us on this. Uh, thank you to everybody that participated here with us today. We have um, a lot of questions that are still coming in, and um, so many great points that, you know, we notice that there's always kind of a, a theme in every presentation, and it's interesting to see how that, that develops, and so we'll make sure that we send out, uh, you know, more uh, literature to come soon on, on uh, the most commonly asked questions here, and those that, you know, just came up over the last few days of presentations that we've done with our trustee, um, but this is wrapping up our Meet the Trustee event, and we just truly appreciate Keybank so much for coming to visit with us and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Uh, it's been amazing. I think it's a great partnership, and thank you, Rihanna. We really appreciate what we do with the ARC and how we work together, and thank you. And it's great to be back in person. <laughs> yes, it sure is. All right. Thank you, everything for everyone, for joining us today. Take care, everybody.